thank you for coming. This is, uh, for some of you, this is class. This is experimental storytelling. For others of you, this is an introduction to Texas Immersive, which is a new specialization that Stan Richards School of Advertising and PR is uh, launching October 22nd. The applications will be open uh, for a November 26th deadline. Uh, for students to go through a specialization on immersive, which is a combination of audience, storytelling, and emerging technology, sprinkled with a little bit of innovation because I'm head of innovation, so you gotta learn those hard skills. Um, uh, the panel today is called Understanding Immersive, and we have guests with us today, Alyssa Wallace, a Senior VP of Publishing for MWM Interactive, which is Madison Wells Media. They're based out of Los Angeles. We have Brandon Padbean, who's the producer of War Remains. Raise your hand if you went and saw War Remains. Ah, so this... This should be a, g a good conversation. Um, he is associate producer at MWM Interactive. And then we have Jen Kadic, right? Kadic, producer of War Remains, head of production at Flight School Studio, which is based in Dallas. Right. That's right, so we got a local Texan here, um, which is nice. I love seeing LA and Texas, uh, California and Texas working together, my two favorite states, since I've lived in both. Um, so we're gonna show a quick video, and then we'll bring the panelists on and have a conversation, and then I'll open it up for Q&A at the end. Y'all ready? Good, let's go. My grandfather had a, a plaque or a phrase on the side of his wall that was never judge another man until you've walked a mile in his moccasins. And it's part of the idea of empathy. And it's part of why these extreme experiences are interesting to me. And that's what we talk about trying to get a step closer. I mean, to have empathy with somebody who went through a massive shelling ordeal is, is nigh impossible. At the same time, this is farther than you've ever been able to get before. And so what I thought VR would be great at is showing you something that even when a person describes it to you is still unimaginable. What VR can do is fool your lizard brain. It can make the hair on the back of your neck stand up even though your conscious brain knows that this isn't real. The combination of all those things together seemed a likely place to try to recreate a nightmare. Remember something, on the Western Front of the First World War, Things can always get worse. They can always get much, much worse. Dan Carlin is one of the world's greatest storytellers. And anyone who has ever spent any time listening to his audio for even a few minutes understands that that's the case. The challenges of this project have almost entirely been a function of making sure that we're getting Dan's ideas right. The truth about the experience is that it is unlike anything else. I'll take you here. Holy shit. <coughs> That's gonna turn some people inside out. You think so? Uh-huh. Good. We call this experience an immersive memory. And by that we mean it's really tricky to tell the story of World War I in 15 minutes. It's virtually impossible. However, working with Dan Carlin, the team at Flight School and the team at Madison Wells came to this concept of an immersive memory, which is as if you could take the collective consciousness of all the lives that were lost during the war, the emotional weight of World War I, and put it in context so that you can get just a tiny taste of what it might have been like to be there. That is what we're trying to do with this experience. The big thing that we're working on right at this minute is getting the haptics in the floor working. We're gonna see if we can get that done before we actually leave here. You know, working with Dan, there's a level of realism that he wants to bring to the project. You know, he asked us to create an uncomfortable place, but with these VR projects, people come in and they expect it to sound like a movie, they expect it to sound like a video game, and they expect it to sound like real life. And I think that if you want to meet the expectations of your audience, it actually has to be all three. One of the nice things about a VR project like this is, you know, it was actually an exciting opportunity for us to, to go that far and make something that scary. I think we're pretty good, though. If we just drill down on what we have, um, we've, got, we've got time to get it right. When you're talking about replicating extremely negative human experiences, there's a line beyond which you won't want to go. 
it's hard. The terrain becomes hideous and gruesome. If you talk about the artillery, that you feel in your body physically, what the VR can do is give you a taste so that then if you went and read some stuff on the First World War or saw a movie or saw it in some other venue, you'd be able to go, I know that that artillery is something you can actually feel because when I went through this experience, I felt it, right? So if people came out of this with a better understanding of the things that are impossible to imagine, we would have done something positive. Maybe it helps us to better understand our times if we recall that they were built by a generation of traumatized survivors forever reliving an early 20th century nightmare. When Clint and I talk about taking you farther than you've ever been able to go, these are the little elements that- We're attempting to draw you into the collective memory of the past. We want to take people right up to the edge of very traumatic experience, but also allow you to, the freedom to stay grounded and to take it in. So every step you take forward unlocks and passes threshold for more narrative and more unexpected events. It pushes that button inside of you emotionally that like, this is beyond what I was expecting for this experience and it's pushing you into a magical zone. What I really like about it is, based on the encouragement from Dan, we really were able to push it. You know, VR can be very gamey, it can be very stylized, which is something we love to do, but this really pushed our boundaries of creating something photo real. Having Skywalker here and having MWM here, actually walking through the experience and touching the walls and seeing it in the headset and having the headphones on, it's really the only way to experience it. I really do hope that everyone thinks it's one of the best things they've seen in VR. War Remains pushes immersive technology as far as you can take it right now. The experience is so visceral and so real. All of a sudden, your opinion on war and on its relation to history takes on a whole new dimension. As the technology continues to grow and expand, I think the degree to which that you can uh, convey the real reality of being in history only continues to expand and I think that's a question that we're gonna all have to contend with in immersive content period let alone in bringing people back in time. MWM Immersive is the interactive division of Madison Wells Media. At the center of anything that we create in that division we're focused on telling a story uh, and using that medium as a core tool in telling that story. What I was so impressed with was Brandon Oldenburg and the team at Flight School's ability to work with Skywalker and work with us and to work with Dan Carlin to start with just a broad idea of World War I and then boil that down into a 15-minute experience. I'm, ex I'm exceptionally proud of what that team has done and I think the output is, is incredible. This is part of what I love and we love at MWM is the ability to match people who are absolutely the world's best creators in a medium with storytellers who may not be familiar with that medium. We're driven to help those storytellers find the technologies that they need to tell the story the right way. The exciting thing for our company and for our platform is that we talk all the time about the idea that technology is just moving faster than infrastructure can keep up with. And to us, that gives us an opportunity to not have to have everything exactly right now, but to be able to grow and build with it as technology changes, as interactive narrative storytelling evolves. MWM and the MWMI team will be the place, we hope, where creators come to be able to build and tell those stories to an, a bigger and bigger audience using whatever methods are available through time. So how many of you, uh, raise your hand if actually uh, Going to War Remains really impacted, was kind of one of the first immersive experiences you had participated in. Yeah, yeah a lot of you. And how many of you, or a couple of you, that actually, uh, it really freaked you out a little bit, correct? Yeah. 
<laughs> so I think when I watch this uh, video and I, you've done your job, you know, you, you've really been able to impact the audience in, uh, in, ident you know, in identifying with World War I and seeing what that type of battlefield is like. It's pretty amazing. So I'm going to jump right into these questions uh, because uh, it really relates to how we've been laying out experimental storytelling. I'm going to start with you, Alyssa. Can you tell us what MWM um, immersive, or do you call it interactive? We just changed the name to MWM Interactive. Interactive, okay. Um, hold on, can, can we start there? Why did yeah. you change so it from immersive to interactive? When the company, uh, when our division was formed, it was purely for VR experiences. And so the immersive language was applicable, and that's how companies are referred to who are in that space in VR entertainment. And so uh, within the last year, the mission for the company or for our division rather has changed to include PC and console games. And so we wanted to broaden that. We will still be making VR experiences, but wanted to broaden that to include those. So it's now MWM Interactive. Yeah, I, I find that fascinating that y'all are figuring out words. We're figuring out words. The Acad the Television Academy is trying to, I don't know if you know if um, the peer group on uh, Interactive just changed to new media. It's like we're all struggling with really trying to define this convergence of media to create experience. And it'll be interesting to see what will happen in the next couple of years. Uh, as to which words, maybe they're all, I think in the end, they all just kind of relate to the same thing. So um, how, how does MWM Interactive, how does it fit into the larger MWM ecosystem? Because I do believe there's other divisions. Yes, so MWM stands for Madison Wells Media, and the company has been around in one form or another for a number of years previously as a film and entertainment studio called Odd Lot. And Gigi Pritzker, who's our CEO and founder, uh, was making films. And then when she met Clint Kisker, who you saw up on the screen just now, they formed Madison Wells Media. And the way they structured the company was along the lines that each division would have a business lead and a creative lead. And there are four divisions that are uh, sharing by design across the, you know, so we talked a lot about transmedia. Um, and so sharing content across the different divisions. And the four divisions are our interactive group, film and television is one, uh, live theater. So it's called live, but it's for uh, Broadway. We are an investor in Hades Town, um, which won the Tony for Best Musical last year. And then we have a group called Universe, so MWM Universe. And that uh, division is responsible for coming up with uh, new worlds out of different kinds of IP, intellectual property. I don't know if you all know what that means, but so it might be a comic book. It might be uh, an artist. We have an exhibit opening in Chicago next week from an artist named Hebrew Brantley uh, that is building a world around him. So the company has these four divisions, and our goal as one of those divisions is to find ways in which to work with the others. And, and so you are uh, a senior VP of publishing for MWM Interactive. Can you, can you explain to students who are always looking for careers, what is that and how did you get to this role? Oh my God, well. That's I'm gonna ask each of you this question well, as I'll I ask you a first question. I'll tell the 30 second version of that because that is a super long story that I usually talk for an hour about. So, um, so uh, publishing in a video game company refers to the business of video games. And so Ethan, who is Brandon's boss, is the executive vice president of content. And I, I mentioned earlier, each division is led by a creative person and a business person. So I'm the business person leading the interactive group alongside Ethan, my partner. And so we need somebody who has a very uh, high aesthetic creatively, and Ethan has an incredible background. Um, a VR project that he p helped produce is the first and only, I think, VR uh, experience to win an, uh, an Oscar. So that's amazing. And so my role is, we will talk about it a little bit later, but to figure out ways to make money from what we're creating, 
and to uh, make sure that the business side, the legal, the marketing, all those factors that go into releasing products, they all work together. And, and Brandon, you are the producer of War Remains in MWM Interactive. Mm -hmm. um, first explain to me what is your role and then, and then maybe kind of frame it in how you got Dan Carlin involved, because that's pretty cool. Sure. Um, <clears throat> um, well, maybe I'll start with how Dan got involved with, with the project. So um, that was a relationship that our company had through Clint Kisker. Actually, Clint's twin, twin, twin brother, Sean, um, was CFO at uh, Lionsgate. Um, and he met Dan through there and understood that Dan really wanted to do virtual reality. Um, and at this time, a lot of people were talking about during, doing virtual reality, but very few people were you know, as fortunate as we were to actually get to try some like really AAA stuff like this. So um, Dan and Clint built a relationship and sort of in that process, um, I, I'm a Dan Carlin Uber, Uber fan. Um, and so um, obviously all of us in the company know the material, but Dan and I were able to kind of build a certain kind of special relationship and we can really communicate. And then just slowly as the project evolved and um, frankly, as I was growing in the company, um, I was fortunate that my bosses, like Ethan, gave me a little more room to start really developing the material with Dan. So um, the way that I see at least my role on the project as a representative for MWM, so this is a huge team effort. Um, and there's lots of people like, you know, Jen and her whole team who are, you know, carrying a lot of the load. But it's, it's almost like the project is on like a, a teeter-totter, right? Um, and it's always just tipping in different places and my role as being part of the publisher is just whatever it takes to keep it balanced and that can involve like a lot of different things so um, sometimes you know we, we all have kind of our own projects that we sort of oversee and sometimes um, when you're talking about creative type work which is a lot of what my role was on War Remains um, you have an artist come in and the vision is very very defined um, and then all you really need to do there is sort of produce, right, kind of whatever it takes to get the project across the finish line. Um, and that can involve all sorts of crazy things. That can involve, for example, um, driving Dan Carlin at 2 o'clock in the morning from an airport to Skywalker Ranch in the middle of nowhere. Um, it can involve all sorts of things. But for me, what the, uh, my most fulfilling role on the project was, so what Dan does is 30-hour podcasts where it's just him and a microphone and a sound booth. Well, now we're going to do a 15-minute piece of content that has all these different effects and is a totally new thing. Um, and so a lot of work was required to um, work with Dan to get him to the place where his vision can totally be realized. So I think a really important part is it's not about sort of your vision or your ideas. It's about the artist in their vision and being able to truly love and truly understand what it is they're trying to do. Um, and I like to say, you know, we all know, like, if you're a Dan Carlin fan, Dan Carlin's going to hit a bullseye on the writing 100%. But this is a kind of new world. And so how do you know his material so well and know w what he's trying to do so well and almost kind of curate his material so you can help him help him hit that bullseye that he actually couldn't see yet, um, especially taking someone into a medium, into a new medium. So, um, you know, I was very fortunate that Dan and Brandon Oldenburg, our director, um, really welcomed me into the creative process. Um, and I'll share. So I think, you know, it's one thing to like be a creative executive and just give notes on things. Notes is easy. Everyone has an opinion. You know, we can all just throw out our opinions. It's another thing to really get, uh, not to make a pun, but like into the trenches with the creator and really like and argue, have three hour arguments and be comfortable that like, this is the talent, but like we need to work together to get them somewhere. So you, I see you as a little bit like a translator. You know enough of the affordances of the media you were playing with, but also you dive deep into becoming an expert in Dan Carlin. Yeah, that's and, a really big part of it. And kind of like worked between those two spaces. Yeah, I mean, and that's definitely the stuff that I think is the most fun. But what it also takes in my role is like, and obviously a lot of people are involved in this, but like we took the piece to Tribeca, right? Well, a 
50 foot truck, you know, full of equipment and a set that required building and all these different things. Well, it didn't magically appear. And that's sort of what I'm saying in the beginning about the teeter totter is you need to have a really diverse skill set and be watching everything. Got it, got it. Um, I think the students are familiar with that. We broke them into different groups. So there's producers, account managers. I think everyone is, are y'all raising your hands going, oh, I've been doing this for this project I've just worked on. You know, see some nods in the thing. Um, it's nice, interdisciplinary work. Are y'all getting that? <laughs> it's definitely interdisciplinary work. Um, so Jen, uh, MWM hired flight school to take war remains from ideation to a location-based experience. Can you speak to how uh, MWM approached you to develop the experience and tell us about the challenges and responsibilities of work collaborating with a publisher? Sure. So um, I'm Jen, head of production at Flight School. Um, so I believe where this or first originated was our relationship with Ethan. Um, we've worked with him on previous projects when he was at another studio. Um, and that was, that was a great experience working with him. So um, when the project first came to us, um, it was in development for a bit with MWM, and they were working on it with Dan for a while. And, um, you know, it coming up with something like this and doing it in a new medium, it just, it takes time. And, you know, like Brandon said, you're trying to boil down all of this amazing work from Dan into, into a smaller experience and in a new medium that he hasn't worked in. So, um, you know, when they approach us, we, of course, involve Brandon Oldenburg, and he is the most incredible at what we call blue sky thinking. So he's able to just kind of take something and say, what if we do this and what if we do that? And just kind of with no reins and no, no boundaries and no barriers. And I feel like that really helped the project um, in terms of like trying to find its way with Dan. Not to say we nailed it the first time. I think we, you know, we had a couple of different explorations and how we, and which we <coughs> may get into more along the way, but um, you know, what flight school is, great at is we have, you know, Brandon on one side who is just this, you know, incredible creative mind. Um, but then, you know, we have to back that up. So he has, he comes up with all these great ideas and, um, you know, just creates these beautiful worlds and beautiful concepts. But then, you know, we have to, um, put together a strong production team and a strong, uh, technical team and team of artists to bring it all to life. So, um, you know, we were fortunate that MWM trusted us with that process and, um, made our way through it with Dan and Brandon and the team. Yeah. <laughs> so let, let's, There's I, a lot more detail there, but I'll let you go on to the next question. Well, I'd love to actually uh, talk a little bit about the process because the students are learning um, how to work within constraints and how to work within a budget. Like they had a budget for their first project and they'll have another one. Um, I'm sure you had a budget yes. that you were given to. Uh, and big ideas, you know, yeah. can be very big, yeah. right? How do you how do you actually manage that? Like, uh, what is you know what is it from? How do you actually manage the needs of the client and the wants of the client with actually what can actually be produced sure. in the time and budget? Yeah. So I think you know what I've learned and what we've all learned working in the interactive space is um, things are very hard to estimate, <laughs> which may not be a good answer, but um, especially when you're working in VR or games or anything interactive. Um, you know, there's the amount of time it takes to actually do something. Okay, it takes this long to model something and this long to animate it, and you put an engine. But then there's actually interacting with it. And it just has to, it has to feel right, right? So it's not like creating a CG commercial where it's like you're going to animate it, you're going to light it, and you're going to render it, and you run out of time and that's it. With this, it's you could do all of those things, but like if it's not, if people aren't interacting with it properly and if it doesn't feel right, it's not done. So what you have to do in this scenario, and it's it's challenging, is is figure out a way to navigate a project like that where there are so many unknowns. So um, you know you do your best to create a budget up front, and you know you put money in different buckets, and you know you're like, okay, we're gonna have this much time of storyboarding, and then concepting, and then we're gonna start you know gray boxing an engine, and we're gonna start modeling, and then we're gonna animate, and we're gonna do all of these things. Um, but you have to you have to give yourself milestones along the way to kind of stop and reassess. And you know, whether that be a prototype phase, okay, we tested, you know, these ten things that we wanted to prove out and see in this phase. Are they working? Are they not? If they're not working, how do we change them and still stay on track? Um, so I think it's 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 less about, oh, you know, we only 
bid 20 days of animation and now this is 25. You know, at the end of the day, it's one budget and you have to be able to, you have to be able to know kind of, okay, well, we didn't, we weren't going to do that, but we're, now we're going to do that. So, but if we do that, how do we, you know, how can we afford everything else? Right, and so this is nice. mixed reality. Yeah. So, you know, you're blending not just all the digital production costs, but also the physical build costs. Correct. Which is new to and really those things both bring influence those together. each other, right? Yes. So, um, and Brandon and I were just talking about this earlier. Like, for example, we when we first like blocked out the trench, right? So first, you're going to start with like a grayscale, just like gray boxes and engine to like start modeling it out. And then you get a little further, you add a little more detail and a little more detail, and a little more detail. And we were pretty far along in this process of like having the basic trench layout modeled. And then when we started working with our partners uh, built by Bender, um, you know, we had all this like curves and details in the wall and they were like, you know, based on the budget they had, that was going to be too complicated to physically fabricate, right? Cause it's, you know, it was, it was, it was, too complex. So then I was like, okay, well then, you know, we have to weigh costs and time, right? So who's going to, who's going to absorb that change? Is it, they have to figure out a way to fabricate it and spend money there, or we take a step back in our process and simplify so that they can fabricate it to match. We ended up changing on our end because changing it in, in, in CG was, um, was easier than trying to build these complicated walls. So there's things like that, that will change along the way. You know, we weren't expecting that, but with, you know, with the right budget and schedule, you're able to absorb those changes and accommodate those changes. And you have multiple partners all working together. I wanna, yeah. Can yeah. I just address that? So I just wanna, for the students, you know, when Jen is coming up with a budget, she's really focused on how long it takes a person to do something. So the budget is what we call man hours. Um, and so it, it takes, you don't know how long something's gonna take. And so she is estimating that she thinks something will take two people, 10 man hours or whatever that is, and then rolling all that up together. I just wanted to add that to what she was saying. And then pretty much everybody throughout that chain, um, Built by Bender is the name of the company that fabricated the physical uh, set for us. And then there was another group that we brought into Austin to create the, the rest of everything around that. Uh, so there's a lot of pieces that go into um, making sure that in the end you guys have a great experience when you go through War Remains. Yeah. And side note on budgets and estimates, like it takes, it takes a lot of experience to feel it and to feel it out and you know you learn you're like okay I know that this artist always on overestimates his time and he tells me oh it's impossible and he gets it done in a day and I have this other artist that says no problem it's done in an hour it takes five days so you learn certain you know certain nuances with people you work with but I think in the end just side note unrelated for you guys going out there and working on budgets and estimates overestimate <laughs> because you need that pad things will go wrong especially in technology like you're like oh of course that only takes an hour to do it's going to take six hours like it just will something will something will not go right so can I add to that again <laughs> um, yeah I think sorry. there's a lot of there's a lot of account planners probably in here so they're probably very curious about out. the business so I started side. out in advertising as an account planner so the thing I was going to add is if you are creating a experience a game a project what happens when people are starting out is that you budget for that experience and you stop there. Yeah. And what I find throughout my career is that, especially in game development, there is very little attention paid to marketing early on, to having a marketing budget, to having a budget for localization because you have to localize your game into other languages or QA because you have to have it quality tested. Um, to get ratings, if it's going out to the public, it has to have an ESRB rating. So there's all these factors that a lot of times developers are very myopic about just the thing. And, there, and I just wanna say there are all these other pieces that go around it to support it and make it successful. Totally agree. And it sounds like there's a lot of different companies that are bringing their expertise together. So as Jen is actually figuring out the budget for production, how much does MWM get involved in that? Do you, do you just say, you're, you're, you know, give her the budget and let her go? Or do you, do you get, when, when do you get involved? So I 
can hop on that. Yeah. Too, yeah. So I think every project's different, and you know, there's there's um, there's usually an amount a client is going to spend, right? So there's usually a budget that they already have in mind, and I think there's there's wiggle room there if it's like no, but if we do this one thing, it's going to cost a little more, and we just want to convince you to do it. So there's always that level, but I would say that I think on this one in particular, there was there was kind of a set like a set amount that was kind of you know already allocated for this project, and then that's actually helpful for us because if you tell Brandon or any other of my creatives that there is no budget, <laughs> then <laughs> they can so come up crazy. with whatever they want. Um, but when but when there is a number, it actually is great because then we just, we design and we work towards that and we say, okay, we have this amount of money to work with, that's, that's it. Like we have to, we have to figure out what's going to work within that. So that's actually, we love backing into a number as, as it's, as it's referred to. So how close is the end product to the original idea with this well, example? So there. Uh, the the answer is it's it I think the simplest answer is that it's pretty close but uh, it's very close but you have to understand that before the thing that really became War Remains and like that that kernel it's you can draw I think a pretty clear line um, but before that we were actually experimenting with something which was radically different um, um, much more um, kind of artistic uh, much more representational. Um, and it's this is sort of one of those things about working with with creative talent is there's sort of a long for the ride and you're like okay cool this is all going this is all going great until one day they're like you know what this isn't working for me and you're like uh oh <laughs> you know we're we're a little we're far it's called you know? killing your babies <laughs> yeah and I mean it, I think what happened at that some point is it wasn't Dan saying like this is bad it was just Dan saying this isn't this ultimately isn't the vision that I have for this. Um, and then, you know, thankfully when you have really awesome partners like we do at flight school, you're able, you know, and Brandon Oliver goes, uh, okay, it'll actually be more like this, like that. <laughs> um, and then you're like, okay, cool. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of bringing Dan into, okay, we're gonna be transitioning into more of this thing you want. Let's start readdressing the process. So just, just thinking about that, that you were doing something before, how long were you doing that before it switched to what this, what War Remains actually became? So like, I just trying to give the students an idea of time. How long did it take to build this out and work and pull everybody together? So I mean, that previous version was like, was for a bit, um, but the... Like months? The, well, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to jump. Years? I'm trying to jump. No, not year. Not years. Um, uh, I mean, I'm still working on projects from years. <laughs> two. I, I mean, I, th I think the actual answer is maybe a bit too too long before we all kind of realized, like, yeah. oh, this isn't like in line with with what he's doing. Uh, the actually, the actual a couple a couple months. A couple. Uh, a couple months. We were sort of moving in one certain direction, um, and then realized we basically had to upend the whole thing. But I, I think that the helpful answer is once we all sort of came back into a room with Dan and recognized, okay, this is the path, like very quickly, I think we all kind of rallied around that new idea. And my answers are vague because like, I, I see the development of War Mains truly beginning when we sort of reconvened. And, and that's not like wasted time necessarily. I'm saying too long, but I mean, Creativity all builds on itself, as all of you, you know, definitely know. And so much of that stuff, even if it went away, like the vestiges are, of it are still in the new build. What from the time we kind of reset, okay, we're gonna do animation, or we're gonna do this realistic walkthroughs, like a year ish. Yeah, I, mean, I feel right? like we got involved in the spring, and then um, we kind of changed course, like mid to late summer. And we were doing our mocap shoot in September, October, and Bender came on in like October, November. And then we worked on it. I'll, oh yeah, I'll get into that. And then, um, and we were in Tribeca in April. Yes, was Tribeca in April? Yeah. So, so about a full year of production. Yeah, yeah just yeah, about. We were, and, and we were in talks, yeah, so I would say it was a year. A year from from like when when flight school and do. MWM started working together, and you know I know MWM put in time on it before that, just development on their <laughs> end. But we were on it for about a year. And yeah. how often did y'all work together? Is this like a weekly thing? I'm just trying to get students to understand the process of how often you it came varied, together versus worked on your own. It would almost be daily in a lot of ways. Um, you know, there there's different periods of time, right? There's the there's the 
creative time where um, you know we we may be jamming every day or working on a script and bouncing things and in a rush to get things to Dan or on the phone with Dan. And then there's times where it's like, okay, we have a plan. Everyone's agreed. We need to just go work. So there's there's not a lot of interaction during those times where I'm like, okay, we have to build something to actually show you now. Um, those are longer stretches. But I mean, it was definitely a collaborative process. It wasn't like we just were off doing our own thing for any any long period of time. But as far as like the script and actually, I mean, what is the thing about, I'd say Dan, Brandon Oldenburg and I spoke every day, you know, and if not every day, then, you know, every couple of days. And these are like long, extensive conversations um, because the process was ba would basically be Dan would go to the booth and like Brandon O and I would have said, we kind of need you to talk about this. We need you to kind of talk about this. And Dan being Dan Carlin comes back with, you know, a giant pile of material and it's all amazing, but okay, this needs to start being cut, cut down. And so, you know, that's, that's a, a, an enormous amount of work. And so Brandon O and I were spending a lot of time shaping it down, shaping it down, shaping and it down. And building the story and then passing it and then to passing Jen. it, and then, right. Right. And Jen, how do you as head of production navigate changes within experimental immersive projects and teams? It's, it sounds like there was a little bit of zigging and zagging. Um, did that change the team that you had first put on it? Um, yeah, it definitely did. So, which is why I saved my my mocap story. So, for you know, going back to what Brandon was saying about how we were working on something that was a little more stylized, um, it didn't have a ton of animation. It was a little more illustrative kind of moments of war. Um, and you know, once you know, once Dan became more involved, he made it clear that he wanted it to be far more realistic than than what we were proposing. Um, and wanted everything animated and everything moving and everything, you know, and we're like, well, that's expensive. So <laughs> to animate uh, humans, realistic human uh, human movement is 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 tricky. So, um, you know, our pivot there was to do uh, motion capture. So basically we, you know, we hired um, a, a stuntman, actually, and we, you know, plotted out all the different movements we, we wanted. So all the animation you see in the piece is actually by one guy. Um, and he basically was on a big stage with a lot of padding and um, running around doing all those moves with, you know, with the guns and jumping and falling, and he he was incredible. Um, so basically, we're able to do that, you know, spend a one-day shoot, get all of this data, and then we're able to go in and go through that data and pick selects, and then we're able to take that data, apply it to our rig, and, you know, have all that animation so that was a pivot you know and it was a way that we were able to um to answer dan's request it was an unexpected kind of shift in budget and shift in team but we we were able to make it work because it was definitely a more um, affordable solution and and frankly it got us great quality animation for the soldiers yeah and so um brandon how were create it sounds like you talked a lot you brandon and dan were really in conversations about the story but when you think the story always drives it, but there's lots of different moving pieces. How were creative decisions reached? Like, what was that process of bringing all the different teams together as a producer? Um, so, f one of the things that I really enjoy doing, and I think it's it's one th it's one thing to take all this material and make sure that everybody is really understanding, you know, kind of what's what maybe is making Dan special. It's maybe kind of curating like a best of list. Um, and so like in the early days of the project, I spent a lot of time um, basically making like audio plays out of the podcast, like taking it all and like, I have like just journals full of like time codes of stuff and then eventually like transcribed it all so that Brandon Oldenburg can kind of have something to read and then assembling it with uh, like sound effects that I'd pull off of YouTube and everything and just creating mood reels and sort of saying, you know, as the mega fan of Dan and, you know, and communicate here are the things that are really important to Dan. This has to be kind of gruesome. This has to be dark. This has to be um, sort of like a, a horror piece. And obviously there's half of this conversation, there's a half of this answer, which is Brandon Oldenburg's, you know, path doing this. Um, but I think especially in these new mediums, that's that's half the fun, is sort of figuring out how do you keep everybody aligned. Um, and I think communication between all the teams is always the most important thing. Uh, I sometimes have a bit of a rep of just hopping on the phone and literally, like with the team who built 
uh, the set here and just talking at people for 45 minutes, but you trust that people are listening and taking their notes, and then you show up and you're like, yep, that's, you know, that is these, that is the things that Dan has been making it very clear to me are really important, you know, and it's, it's not being shy to say, hey, everyone, we're going to get on the phone today for 10 minutes, and we're going to ask questions, and just making sure everyone's always talking and identifying, you know, who maybe has missed a detail right. and making sure that everyone's working. And also really the good. decision gets made when I tell them they're out of time. They're out of time. <laughs> yeah, good yeah. point. That's the real answer. Yeah. <laughs> but, when but I say I, you need to make a decision now. <laughs> we were literally like sometimes in the audio booth. Like Dan is in the booth or at Skywalker Sound and he's reading something and comes out like, Brandon, this isn't working for me. It's like, Phew, okay, like let me uh, write something right now. And then it just kind of, it just kind of works. So, I mean, I know he's a, uh, Dan is a well-known podcaster, and it sounds like y'all did a lot with audio, but mixed reality, there's all, there's the wind blowing on the hot air balloon, there's the physical touching of the hand. Who made those decisions of moving from just thinking about it from an audio story to actually knowing where the audience would engage and feel? That's all Brandon Alderberg. Got it. <laughs> he, I mean, he really, really was, you know, the one pushing for as, you know, as many haptics as possible. Um, and really, you know, there's other, there's other VR experiences where you can walk around. There's other VR experiences where you can touch things. There's other VR experiences where your space matches your, your setting. But um, I don't, I, I don't, I can't definitively say we're the only ones to do it this detailed. But it's, you know, we really we really did our best to go one for one and get all those little nooks and crannies in there. And, you know, when you grab the balloon strings, when you touch the balloon, when you touch the hand. Um, so he, you know, just kind of following the marching orders from, from Dan about, you know, as realistic as possible, as immersive as possible, like really putting the person there. Um, he, he, that was his, that was his, um, his initiative on that. Yeah. You, you talked about, you know, budgets and sort of how do they all get maintained on, on our side. I mean, like, new budgets sort of come up, and that's, you know, uh, you know, okay, hey, we've sort of budgeted out the core set, but now we, we got to have these fans, we got to have these things. And it's sort of our job at the publisher, you know, to be keeping track of, like, the entire project, project budget. Um, and, you know, Jen knows, like, I'm the first person along with Brandon Olderberg goes, yeah, like, we should have water, we should have smells, we should have all these things. And then you kind of need to look at it and go, shoot, you know, like, at what point do you stop adding things? Right, and, and did you, so, like, uh, my students are learning about play testing and experience over and over again to make sure the audience is really, you know, hitting the marks that you as creatives hope to? Did you find that as you play tested the experience? You let go of things or you added things? Yeah, so um, the video you watched was actually filled in our studio in Dallas, and uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to clear out enough space in our studio to set up the trench in our, in our space, which was, I don't know how we would have done it otherwise if we had to drive to another location. Like we, it was literally just right next to our desk. So, um, you know, we were fortunate enough to be building as we were working and just playing, playing through it at all times. So, you know, while we're working on it, we're, we're like, we're of course going through it, but you always need fresh people to go through it. So, you know, even, even in the beginning when you all raised your hand and talked about how moved you were by it, like it's so great for me to see because I'm so close to it. Like I saw this when it started as gray cubes that, I just I hope that that's the response to it at the end, and it's it's hard to it's hard to know that that'll be the case. But um, but yeah, back to play testing. You know, we kind of like throughout our studio, we kind of have to like save people throughout the process to so like don't let them see it, so that we still have fresh people to go through it um, along the way. Because once somebody has done something and they've experienced it, then they have an expectation, or they know that this is there, they know that that is there. And for something like this, where you're actually walking through it and having to like navigate your way through the set, and we have things moving and things shaking, um, you know, exactly. Like we need to know how people will react in those scenarios. And also everybody's different. And, you know, we tested it as much as we could, you know, at our studio, but then we brought it to Tribeca in New York and saw a whole new set of people reacting to it. No and idea. The yeah. And we, we were, and it was, like. it was a great like ground for play testing. Cause it was like, you know, does somebody, turn around, like what happens if somebody turns around and tries to go back in the balloon or tries to go back in the bunker? Like, what does that mean physically on set? What does that mean digitally in the build that we create? You know, like if you, in 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 uh, VR and 
and real-time content, like things can break when you go back to places you shouldn't be. So we have to build, you know, stop gaps in for that. So um, it's endless. It's it, when you're putting someone in a space and, and guessing how they're going to react, you will never know until you just get enough people through it. And you then still will be surprised when somebody else goes through it and does something different. And so after Tribeca, did you change? Did you change things? Um, we changed a couple things. Um, we we changed some physical things just based on how the technology was performing and how the the headset was tracking. Um, I'm not sure we. I think there's things probably still on the to do list that we want to change that we haven't changed yet. Um, fortunately, nothing major. I think we we were pretty successful in in accounting for a bunch of things, but. Um, but for example, we were just talking about the bunker door, you know, that we, there may, we might want to do something different with that digitally to prevent people from going backwards. So there's always, there's always something that you want to change as you, <laughs> as you see people experience it. <laughs> One of actually like the largest changes that, you know, we saw running it out at Tribeca was, you know, and Alyssa will, will can speak to this, but, you know, we want, you know, people to be able to take this experience into their, you know, into their um, exhibition halls and museums and, um, to be a good partner in that, we have to make sure it's easy to run. We can't hand people some crazy contraption that you know only like a Google tech can run. And so, um, running it at Tribeca was um, a really you know it was a trial by fire. And so when we came back, we made a lot of changes that actually really simplified the um, the calibration process and really quickened the speed at which people could get through and the ease of which it was to, I mean, now it's basically you press the blue button, you press the green button, you press the red button and it, and it works, which is yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so l let's actually, uh, Alyssa, why does MWM Interactive take on a project like this? I, wh wh you know, how do you ultimately judge the success of War Remains? You've had it at Tribeca and then I believe you brought it here to Austin. It's the first city to try it out. I'm curious about that too. <laughs> okay, so when we decided to make War Remains yeah. our mission for the MWM immersive group was to push the boundaries of VR and we were really all in on VR. And we weren't, we didn't really know what that meant at that time and there wasn't uh, a call to for this project, there was not a need for it to make money as much as it was. there was a need for it to push boundaries and create an amazing experience that no one had seen before, which we accomplished. So after Tribeca, Brandon uh, and his team started figuring out, well, where should we take it? What, you know, what cities have the right you know, locations and where could we take it in Austin was one of the first ones that we considered and we decided to have it here. So now what we're doing is we've invited a lot of people here, uh, one of whom is here today, thank you very much, um, who may have an opportunity for us to take it elsewhere. So we may take it on a tour. We may have it available at a university for uh, educational purposes. We may create another set so that it can go uh, on, be at a museum and be on tour. In sometime in the first quarter of next year, we're coming out with a home version. So the one you all experienced is called an LBE for location-based experience. And we are also going to create a version that is that you will be able to download off of your Vive port digital store that will just be in your headset. There won't be a set because you don't have one in your house. So we are creating a home version uh, that also may help us on the educational front. We're, that's my job is to try and figure out how do we take it elsewhere? Uh, can we find sponsors to help us pay for it? Um, because it is not a money-making uh, experience for us, but we don't want to lose more money. So we're trying to figure out what companies would support us in doing that. I think it's fascinating that you're thinking about putting it at a university um, because uh, the first thing I did when I started here was build an Imagine Lab for people to experience emerging technology and story. Like they don't have, not every student has their own headset because it's so affordable right now, right? Right, guys? <laughs> um, so to be able to let them experience it. But LBEs, that's a totally different world for them to understand and build with. 
Um, can you talk to me a little bit further of like, how would you set that up at a university? Are you thinking like a public space or in a studio? Or? Well, they have to have a space big enough to yeah. accommodate the set, which is not an easy like, task. Like maybe like a gallery exhibit, how sometimes uh, right. we have visiting artists. Correct. Mm -hmm. So the so. first conversation starts with, do you have enough space? That's number one. Then uh, what I'm working on right now is putting together a sponsorship presentation of not for the universities, but for the museum angle, because the museums are not going to pay enough for us to even rebuild the set and move it there. They just don't have that kind of funding. And there's another component to this experience. Only six people an hour can go through War Remains as it is currently set up. And that's called throughput in the museum world. So we know that we can't go to the Smithsonian because they have way too many people there. Um, but the World War I Museum in Kansas City doesn't have a huge uh, number of people going through. So it makes more sense for us to consider that. So the process is still evolving. I don't have the answer because we're still figuring it all out right now. Including like figuring out if they license it or buy it outright or oh, do shared revenue? It would revenue. be a license. There, nobody would be buying it outright. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm just curious. Uh, put my producer hat on. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, what's ahead? So is that what's ahead for um, War Remains is to try figuring out what the business modeling is? Business model and how do we share it with more okay. people? Um, we would love to share it with veterans groups. We would love to share it with different branches of the military. Yeah. Um, and so it's that's one piece of it. And the other piece is consumers. So is that a tour? Is that, you know, at, like the King Tut exhibit, it goes to different cities. We don't know yet. We're figuring that out. Mm -hmm. And if somebody wanted to go into development, publishing, or production, I think we've kind of tapped upon all of those. What advice do you give these students uh, for achieving that? Like, where do they get started? Um, well, you guys are interesting because you're already in this field. Um, I think a lot of us found ourselves in this field by way of other disciplines because it's been it's been new. So um, my background is in um, CG, like traditional 3D animation production. And I went to school, my major was film, TV, radio. And when I left school, I probably didn't even know that there was a commercial industry. You know, I'm just like, oh, I'm gonna work on TV or I'm gonna work on movies. And I'm like, oh, right, people have to make commercials too. So um, I actually started at a commercial studio and made my, I started as a receptionist, which um, if I can give anyone sneaky advice, receptionist is an awesome first job. <laughs> so um, I, um, you know, I had an internship and um, I was, you know, just doing, working on a TV show and then doing some script coverage and then the receptionist left and I filled in and I learned that that was the best job in the entire company. It was not being an intern, it was being the receptionist because you get to essentially talk and interact with and help every single person at the studio if you play your cards right. Um, and they didn't know I was an intern. <laughs> so <laughs> they just thought I was the new receptionist. So I wasn't, you know, I wasn't treated any differently. Um, so then, um, then when I was looking for jobs um, after I graduated, I was like specifically looking for receptionist positions because typically studios want the receptionist to be someone that grows within the studio and learns. And I just, within three months after being hired at the front desk, um, became the assistant to an ECD of a company. So, because um, I was not staying at, I was not planning on staying at the front desk for long, but that was my own initiative. So anyway, so that was a little side story, but just I know you're all going to be looking for, for ways to get in. And there's definitely a lot of great entry level positions and things like that. But that's just a little side sneaky note. Um, but I would say that in terms of getting into this space, there's, there's so much you can do now on your own as well in terms of creating your own content. Um, because just software and things are, you know, just a lot more accessible and affordable that anything you can do to, to, to create content or to create examples of work is is probably the best as well. Just like showing that off. Um, and what else? I mean, meeting people like us along the way, <laughs> seeking seeking us out at activations and events. And um, I don't know, what do you guys think? So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, I, I, I have definitely like a strange 
career path, like into where, uh, into what I'm doing right now. So I think, so like many people who want to be, you know, producers or creative producers, um, I started at a talent agency in Los Angeles, which is a really effective way to start meeting people and getting your foot in the door. Um, you know, and I've wanted to be a creative producer since I was very, very, very young boy. So I, I've always been pursuing that. But I think actually the biggest thing um, came when I first met Clint Kisker. Um, and at this point, I'll say, like, because going out and getting jobs is really hard. Like, I was about to think that my dreams were crushed. Like, people are kind of rough in the entertainment field, and I'm, I'm a pretty sensitive guy. And See, so, I'm not hard on yeah. you. Yeah, uh, and, and, and some, some people are. And basically, I found myself at a point where I was like, wow, I, I actually seem to have no opportunity right now. And I met Clint, and um, Clint could have taken uh, anybody to come work for him, but I knew the material super well like I I mean this was in the early days of VR and I like totally knew everything he was up to and so he gave me a shot um, and then I continued to work um, with Clint through Legendary Pictures um, and then ultimately at MWM and I think the biggest thing for those who you know like me um, are not necessarily themselves directors um, or writers or developers but you maybe consider yourself a creative and an artist and you really want to like empower those people and really you know make their projects happen um, and really work with them um, you know everyone's gonna have their own experience but in my experience no one no one is gonna hand you that position at all it's not like you do it for a while and then okay cool here's here's some projects um, I independently after, while working with Clint um, uh, basically created or found some artists and worked really hard with them to develop a series. It was my first series that I sold to Google, and it was just like my own independent thing. And then based on that, um, I had a little more rope so that when the Dan Carlin thing started up, um, and I just, you know, no one said, hey, Brandon, go build a relationship with Dan, or hey, Brandon, like the creative, you know, needs more work here. You just, and this is risky, you know, you definitely need to like be respectful of the folks around you and recognize people have, have more experience but I think a lot of it is you have to really trust that like you're you're good at it and just dive in and just start making making deals happen and making projects happen and, and be careful and make sure that your supervisors know know what you're doing and hopefully if you're fortunate like me they'll support you in it um, but I think that that's the big thing you need to just go out and like find artists who you really believe in and who trust you to work with them and just start making stuff happen. Yeah. And yeah, and I would say some some sideways advice is um you know, as you're as you're growing in the field and you're young in the field, like nothing I would say nothing is below you, you know? Do everything. I'm head of production and I will still get anyone coffee. I will still literally stay up all night and do whatever it takes and it's just that's what people want to see. And to Brandon's point, it's, you know, any promotion I've ever gotten in my career is because I was already doing the job for a while. And, you know, you kind of have to, you don't just sit and like, oh, I've been doing this job for this many years, so I, I should just be given the next step. That's not how it works. It's like you have to be, do you know, it's like the dress is for the job you want, right? It's like you have to kind of already be showing that you're going to do that job, and then they'll be like, oh, you're already doing it, so here's here's the recognition of that. So I just think, like, like Brandon said, always be, you know, reaching for the next thing, respectively, of course, not stepping on toes, of course. There's definitely hierarchy and things you need to be aware of, especially when you're working um, at a company. But um, don't just just go for it. And and a lot of especially at smaller, smaller companies like, you know, flight schools, about 30 people like we have no shortage of needing people to do more, <laughs> to take more on. So like typically if somebody says like, hey, I'm really passionate about this one thing. Can I own this thing? We're like, yes, please do it, you know, we, or, or we didn't even think of that, you know, so it's, it's, um, find ways you can be helpful, find ways you can tackle new things, find things you're passionate about, pitch those things, and you may be pleasantly surprised what people will support, support you with. I just want to add to that, uh, that for both what Brandon and Jen said, that it will really help you if you have a champion or a mentor, whatever you want to call it, in that company, um, in order to, navigate your way through whatever is there politically. Uh, I recommend being a little quiet for the first few months just to get your footing and understand 
who's who and, uh, and I, know when and where yeah, you can speak yeah, up. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and I, in my younger days, was not very good at that. So oh, I me neither. <laughs> Um, so, so if you can find somebody to mentor you, and I highly recommend also while you're in school doing as much as you can on inf with informational interviews of people either like us that are coming here or somebody you just want to meet, you can tell them you have a paper. I'm not going to know you don't have a paper if you call me and say I'm a student at such and so and I've got, I would like to interview you for 20 minutes or whatever. If there are people that do something that you think is right up your alley and you want to know more, r figure out their email. It's not hard. Um, and reach out to them and ask them if they would spend some time telling you a little bit about how they got to where they are and what they recommend for you to follow that path. That's great. I'm going to open it up just for a few questions as we wrap up. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, I'm going to go here and then we'll grab a student. So real quick, yeah, I come from the veteran space, right? And uh, one of the things that I, you know, kind of sunk to me was, uh, you know, recall reading an article some years ago after I had finished my time in the Army about one of the uh, therapeutic and healing methods that uh, they were experimenting with, which was kind of an immersive, interactive type of situation to kind of bring the veteran back to that space, recreating smells and sounds and all that kind of stuff to identify trigger points to actually help in the healing process. Have you all thought about maybe going that direction? Uh, and if not, if so, I would definitely look there. Um, but also, the uh, Infantry Museum in Fort Benning, Georgia, would probably eat something like this up. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to answer both parts of that. Um, we are an entertainment company. So if this experience can be helpful in that way, great. But as an entertainment company, I don't think we would uh, spend resources to uh, accomplish that. I, I just don't think we would, not to say it wouldn't happen. Secondly, my son is in boot camp at Fort Benning, uh, and I'm going there in a couple weeks, and I'm trying to figure out now I have a place. So there's an infantry museum, and so now that's one of the places I want to go talk to. So I'm excited. Thank you for that. And I think that's what's interesting about possibly partnering with university on some of your entertainment properties is I've done a VR and empathy study and I went through War Remains with my research hat on thinking about ways that we could actually uh, teach students to develop new storytelling characteristics to foster, you know, issues like this. Uh, so really interesting. Uh, what, another question. Um, yeah. I was curious why you chose Austin first. If, if you're based in Dallas, uh, why this was the choice? In Los Angeles. Oh, yeah, in Los Angeles. Um, honestly, it was, a, it was a market research thing. Um, you know, we're pretty data-driven. Um, and when we tapped into it, we were looking for, okay, where is Dan's audience? Where is sort of the tech video game type audience? And where is the history audience? And uh, Austin was the top of the list. Um, and we thought, well, it kind of fits as like a micro South by Southwest type of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, tried to convince them to keep it in Dallas. But <laughs> they did. We got told no a bunch of times. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Another question. Okay, uh, I'll do you, and then we'll come back to Mallory. Uh, hi, I I loved the experience, and I thought the VR with the tactile nature of the set working so well together was brilliant. My question is, what made VR for you the right method to tell this story other than having like a more traditional way of like a set and like images and descriptions and such like that? So like with so many things, I mean, it starts with, with Dan. Um, and part of what I think makes MWM really cool is we have so many different mediums that we can tackle. Um, and like kind of Clint was talking about, we hope when an artist comes and they say, well, I want to make a podcast, you know, okay, cool. Um, Dan came in and said, I want to build a time machine. And that's just always been his, his, his dream. Um, and so, you know, Dan talks a lot about, you know, the written word, uh, film, um, even, you know, uh, all, all this material could definitely get you part of the way. But one thing that I, I found really interesting in talking with him was, um, we, I think a lot of people recognize, say, Saving Private Ryan, the opening scene is one of like the classic, really haunting um, war scenes. And Dan's attitude is actually like, 
Like it's, you know, uh, that scene is nothing. And, you know, if the artillery had really been, you know, presented realistically, you wouldn't have seen anything and you wouldn't have heard anything. And so um, if you listen to his material, it's extremely visceral and extremely detailed. Um, and people come the day on to make TV and movies all the time. Um, but I think VR was a chance for him to do something that specifically was not a story, um, but it was an experience. And with, for all the reasons that you mentioned, VR is kind of a, a, a totally next frontier of how to communicate and experience. And he, he's really clear, and we're really clear, like, it's not combat because we all, we go see the show, and then we come out, and we go get Starbucks, and just clearly it's not all the way, but we think it's about as close as any technology right now can get you to fully going in the dance world and what he talks it about. Also, it also, it was a it was a area in which there was an opportunity to set a new bar, right? Whereas, you know, movies have shown have shown war and, you know, there's video games that have shown it as as realistic as possible and and when it comes to VR, it's like, okay, well, who's who's done it? And, you know, it's not to say no one has, there's there's other experiences, but we felt that, you know, it was a there was a chance for us to maybe set a new bar, and also, you know, great point that Brandon made is it wasn't it wasn't a story that you just watch on a screen. It was all those things, right? The tactile nature, the 360 nature, the the sound, and you know, being able to reach out and touch things. So. Um, I think this kind of or that kind of led into this, but I think a lot of us, like after we all kind of came together and we had all seen it, a lot of the conversation was around like, oh, that was really gruesome or like that was really gross and like that freaked me out. And so as a class, we had like a pretty large group discussion and um, y'all kind of touched on a little bit. You said like there was a line where we were like, okay, we're trying to get as close to this line as like scary and realistic as we could without, I guess, crossing it. And so I guess my question is how did y'all navigate that line what was the point where you were like no that's too much or like oh people are gonna get freaked out or whatever well it's a lot of like so many of these decisions i mean it's it's a lot of just talking it out you know it's just back and forth but but specifically actually i think the line goes goes in both directions because you know dan's always pushing for it to be kind of more gruesome and more realistic but he talks a lot about like if we wanted to we could just crank the volume up all the way and make it as loud as artillery and just knock out your drums but um <laughs> D dan puts it uh, he put it hysterically i thought he's like you know um well if i told you that i was going to give you a, a perfectly uh, realistic uh, experience of an 1800s dental experience you know you probably don't want to buy a ticket and like okay yeah that's true so you know, we obviously, we are an entertainment company. We want people to come in and, if not be entertained, have, you know, a moving experience. And so the line, I mean, a, a lot of it's going to be our director kind of saying this is this is too much. Um, but I, I think um, we found a good, you know, we have a giant parental advisory warning on the front. I think that's actually part of maybe the, the marketing of it. We're sort of setting you up for that experience. But... Um, you know, we didn't want to do anything that was like offensive because that's not the point. But it was really important that I mean, this was war is horrifying, and this is an especially terrifying conflict. And so it was really just about how are we being just truthful. I think it's sort of you know where where is the honesty? Not shocking for like shocking right. sake, and like you know, there's a lot more we could have done to just be like really in your face and over the top. But there were certain things that okay, you know, we'll put that over there. You know, you could go up and see it closer if you wanted to, but you know, that's not necessarily a point. Put some other things a little farther away out of reach. So um so yeah, trying to get those moments in and hear, you know, hear that hear that feedback from Dan and hear what he was pushing for and you know what people would really see, but not there was there's no intention to go so over the top. Even if even if the real situation was, you know, worse. There, there I, I like that you actually call it a memory, too. Was it an immersive memory? Yeah, and I, I remember some of the sound. Uh, maybe this was on purpose, but there were some sounds that actually felt like it was in a distance. Yeah. So when I heard you say memory, it made me think that you're not trying to push it over the top. You're trying to actually bring us back a little bit to nostalgia and identity of what that ex what that place and environment could be. This is really good. One last question, and then uh, and then I think we need to wrap it up because these students might need to get to their next class. I'm also a huge Dan Carlin fan, and sometimes his podcast, like, it's a multiple-day thing because it takes so long to listen to one. Um, 
How was the 15 minute deadline? How was that decided? Was that more of like a budget thing? Or um. <laughs> so, I mean, I, as an Uber fan, I mean, there's like for me when Dan and I are kind of in the room figuring out what are we going to talk about. There's a lot of those stories from Blueprint, like well, we got to talk about this, we got to talk about that. Um, and Dan's obviously down for Dan either doesn't want his voice in it at all, which is an interesting thing, or you know he's down to tell the whole story. Um, it was really Brandon Oldenburg's guidance who got us into the right place, and he was really good at kind of roping me back to, like, we don't need to share this part of the podcast for that part of the podcast. I mean, and Dan will tell you, like, if only we could make the thing two hours and 30 minutes, you know, <laughs> but at what point are you spending, you know, half a billion dollars on a, like, on a crazy... My movie. eyes would be blurry by that yeah, point, too. <laughs> Good. Well, can we give a round of applause for Alyssa, Brandon, and Chen? Thank you so much.